Uh, so today um, we're going to look at uh, five, oh, sorry, I think I've gone one too far. All right, sorry. Uh, these are the overarching key messages for the whole Zoom series that we're doing. Uh, so we're looking at how we meet good practice through these, um, this series. Um, and one of the key things is understanding the procedures and really why you're using those particular procedures that you use within your school. Um, so the why is always a good question there. Um, secondly, ensuring and checking that your the planning tools that you're using for EOTC are either the current ones or that they do the same job as the current ones. Lots of schools do clever things with these tools um, and that's and lots of editing of them and that's great. Um, but it's just checking that those tools are keeping up with what is current. Uh, those current tools sit um, on links off the EONS website, which I'll show you um, how to find at the end if you haven't found them already. And then the last really key overarching message is around staff competency and really ensuring, ensuring that everyone involved in whatever activity you're doing understands that activity and has the skills and knowledge um, and competence to really uh, run that activity safely. So we'll come back to those key messages um, as we move through the, the different um, Zooms that we're going to cover. So uh, today we're looking at transport, um, the EOTC guidelines, this document here covers transport, consent and safety on page 39 and it has five main sections that we'll look at today. Uh, the first one involves vehicles. And um, key thing with vehicles is of course that they're registered and they hold a current warrant for fitness. Now for school vehicles, um, it's important that you have a system set up um, for man managing that. Uh, it can be as simple as a tick box that the teacher in charge is checking on the standard operating procedures as they go to get the vehicle and leave school. And then some sort of reminder system for wh whoever is in charge of managing that process, whether it's the caretaker or um, someone in admin that's gonna take the vehicle down to make sure it has the warrant and is ready to go. Uh, for private vehicles, it's trying to set up a, um, a system where you're uh, getting information off your uh, volunteer drivers. You can use the volunteer assistant form um, to do that. And the volunteer then says, or signs that that's their vehicle will have um, a current warrant of fitness and is registered. And then on your documentation that the teacher in charge is using, they can just have a tick box uh, to say that they have checked that off. Um, all about trying to work out a system um, to be as efficient as you can um, when you're leaving school, but also making sure that you've got those checks in place. Um, definitely been a few um, cases uh, with teachers rather embarrassed about uh, their lack of current warrant of fitness as they go to drive their vehicle off the school grounds. So it's always worth checking. Uh, for drivers, uh, for drivers, um, drivers must all have the appropriate license. And for school staff, um, a good efficient way of managing this is through your personnel systems. Um, you just hold a copy of their license on file. Uh, it's great if you can track an expiry date um, against that. Um, we sometimes get caught out um, with those dates and it can work alongside tracking their first aid certificates and expiry dates. Uh, the staff competency record form can help you collect that information. And then it's just about how it works best with um, your personnel systems that you manage, how you collate that information within your school system. Uh, for volunteers, there's a couple of ways of gathering that license information. Um, either using the volunteer assistant form um, at uh, the time of the event and uh, getting a copy of their license then. Um, or a number of schools now are 
asking their parents at enrollment time when the parents are uh, signing up or signing the blanket consent form for their students and enrolling, um, if they're willing to volunteer and at that stage using the volunteer assistant form and getting a copy of their license then. And then just holding that on record and when the teacher in charge goes to check that the student's got blanket consent, they can also see that the driver um, has a copy of their license in the, in the office or wherever that's being held. Uh, the other part around drivers is they must be trained and competent um, for what you're asking them to do. And for school staff, you can manage that through the school induction process. So when they're um, starting at school, working through all of those processes uh, where you induct them into the school. Um, so it's important to capture if they're going to be a staff member that'll be driving a van or driving their own um, private vehicle with school students in it, that that is part of uh, inducting them into the systems that you run at school. Um, so sort of for a van, kind of the minimum might be a few laps around the block with uh, a competent driver, experienced teacher, um, before they have students in that van, walking them through all the process of signing out the van and all of those types of things that go along with it. Uh, and then kind of best practice would be uh, on their first trip with students that they have that uh, competent driver in the passenger seat. It's not always practical, but you need to um, make some judgments about that around people's or your, your staff's competency as well. You'll know um, uh, from that first sort of trial drive and your gauge on their competency whether what support you need to put in place before they are competent to drive a van full of students, uh, which looks really different um, to driving themselves and their own kids around. For volunteers, um, the volunteer assistant form asks them um, about their competencies, um, but it is really key um, when you're asking them to drive in conditions that are higher risk. Um, so for example, the gravel roads, up ski fields, towing a trailer, that the, there's a really robust conversation to ensure they understand what they're being asked to do and the conditions they're being asked to do it in and that they're competent. So the ski fields is a classic example um, where, you know, have they driven up a ski field road before? Uh, do they know how to put on chains? Do they have chains for their vehicle if, if they're using a private vehicle? Um, and those conversations are really important. And with both of those processes, it's really important to record uh, that you've had those conversations and what the answers were. And for school staff where you're doing training, that you make sure you in, record the training that they've had um, for those particular um, situations. So are there any questions as we go on, um, the sort of vehicles and drivers the stage. Hi, um, I'm Shelley from Tarahu College. Kia ora, Shelley. Hi, I have a question. Um, it's come up a bit. Um, what is the deal with driving your own private vehicle and then insurance? Do you have to check that? Do we have to get the drivers to check that they're insured? I don't uh, know. It would, when they're using their own private vehicle um, they're not because they're volunteers they're not commercial drivers but um, it would pay for them to check with their insurance company okay and, and I'm sure that will be the answer but it always pays for them to check because uh, yep. they're all a little bit different um, and then also what are your um, views on we have staff that sometimes instead of driving the school van or the school vehicle, they prefer to take their own car. What's the views on that? Should they be taking the school vans or school vehicles first priority? Uh, that's, oh, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, again, it would be... Um, I think a good idea for them to check with their insurance company how that affects their own insurance. Yeah. Uh, as far as sort of wider systems, 
I mean, if you're happy that their car's registered and warranted um, and um, then that's probably fine. But again, you might decide that you actually just want, um, you know, the, the whole cost recovery and those things and how you um, manage paying people for petrol costs and things might just be easier done in your, in your school cars. So yeah. It's kind of a school decision, really. And you know how you said the volunteer system, they can tick off that their car's registered and warranted. Yep. If they're taking kids to sport, how do we actually know that it is? You know what I mean? Like on a Sunday morning, there's not necessarily going to be a teacher there to check off that the soccer kids person's driving that has got it registered and warranted. I think you have to be a bit pragmatic there and that you're asking them a number of things on that volunteer assistance form um, and they're signing that they're going to comply with those things. Yeah. And, yeah so you have to put some trust um, in that process as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, ideally, it'd be great if someone was there to tick it off, but that's not always the case. Okay. Um, so I think it's okay to put that trust in and you ask them the question. They've said they would. Um, so you kind of rely on them following up and doing that. Cool. Thank you so much. No problem. Fiona, there are a few more questions, but perhaps the people, um, if I just um, call them out, the people that actually wrote them into the chat could ask them. So James, um, you've got a question about blanket consent. Yeah, just um, obviously we organise a lot of trips and, and get people to um, um, uh, go through to uh, assessments of, of, of the health and safety, um, call it RAMS if you like, as you go along. But where we've got a teacher or a staff member running a, a, a group of students to a local, um, local um, event, um, do we need to actually go through and actually complete that um, um, individual consent and, and risk assessment for that particular trip? Because we have so many events where students are being taken to local venues, um, and yet, um, you know, it's a huge rigmarole to do a risk assessment every time we're just putting a student in the car just to go down the road. Absolutely. And um, I'm going to show you an example of standard operating procedures at the end, um, which I think ties into exactly what you're talking about here. Um, so blanket consent, uh, I think those low risk local activities uh, is a key thing for managing and that so you're not going back to students and um, parents every time you're going down to the local park or um, driving them um, 5Ks to the sports field, that the parents give consent for those type of low risk everyday activities once at the start of the year. Um, they're normally within the school um, hours, um, but there's a, there's a little bit of information and an example on the EONS's website as well um, around what can be covered by blanket consent. Um, and in the EOTC guidelines. So yes, absolutely, I think um, some of this driving should be covered by blanket consent. And um, using a standard operating procedure that's been developed through a risk assessment process, um, but then becomes the standard way you do it, um, is a really a much more um, effective uh, and time um, really much more effective for both for time and for consistency across um, staff members running the same activity. Um, so I'll show you an example of that at the end. And so Fiona, just really, when I'm talking about the parameters of that, um, and I, I don't want to take up your time too much, but um, where does it move from a blanket consent to a um, individual consent? Uh, so there's some really good guidance in the EOTC guidelines around that, and it's um, things that are um, a little bit higher risk, a little bit further away, um, probably outside of the school day, 
Uh, but there's some other examples as well. So for example, if you were taking the kids down for a swimming um, event at the beach, that's probably something where you would get individual consent. If you were taking them away overnight, individual consent for that activity. Um, a lot of the things that just happen in your normal day-to-day -day school, going down to the supermarket to do a little stack survey, going down to the playground or the park, um, your cross-country run around um, the local domain, all of those things can be captured under blanket consent. Okay, and as a wrap up to my question, I'm sorry, people. Um, where does, um, where do we draw the line as far as, uh, and, and this is putting out to all schools and everybody, um, do we have to do RAMs and uh, risk assessment every time we go out of the region or overnight or into a high risk activity? And, and do they rely on the board to provide that consent? Uh, so, as well as the parents, that is. Right. Um, so kind of, we probably want to tease those two things apart. So consent comes from the parents um, and permission uh, for the event or approval of the event comes either from um, the board or who the board is delegated within the school. Um, so most schools will delegate most of that decision making, if not all of it, down to either the principal or the senior leader in charge of EOTC or the EOTC coordinator, depending on where the expertise fits um, in their school. And then um, for those higher risk ones that you talk about, uh, more than likely you will be using a um, whole risk assessment process for those um, activities. Um, it is a big piece of work, there's no doubt about it, the first time you do a, one of those processes for that activity. But every other time that activity happens or something like that activity happens, then um, you shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, you should be picking up what you've already done and um, looking at uh, any lessons that were learnt from that particular activity and any changes you need to make uh, to the risk assessment you've done and obviously with a lens of your um, students that are going on this particular activity and the um, when what they bring to the activity and to any changes in where you're going um, you know so you might have gone in summer last time and now you're going in winter so there'll be some different considerations um, in that planning Okay, I, um, I dropped a link to the, our website page that actually carries the toolkit forms, Fiona, uh, because there had been a question about uh, where that volunteer assistance form sits. So um, there's, a, there's directions to that. These are exactly the same toolkit forms as found on TKI, um, and, uh, but they're a little bit easier to access directly off our website. Um, so I see there's a last question there on how do we manage the experience and competency of bus drivers when we hire the buses? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and um, that's a conversation you have with the bus company that you're hiring the bus drivers from. And uh, they have um, responsibilities under the Health and Safety at Work Act around their training and um, and the competencies of their bus drivers. So uh, it's great to have that conversation and to check that uh, they are providing competent bus drivers, um, but it's not for you to, um, to sort of have to check that by any sort of um, test, I guess might be the way to put it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yep. All right, if we um, we'll move on and have a look at um, seat belts and child restraints. So um, the, these are the requirements under the New Zealand law. Uh, and 
you know, you'll be well aware of these in your school, but there are some um, areas um, for consideration. And I've had a number of questions around um, this particular area for um, what do those regulations and then the good practice that sits above those regulations look like for school transport. Uh, so kind of the international best practice that comes through around child restraints is this idea of being in a child constraint until you're 148 centimetres or 11 years. Uh, and then the idea too that um, although lap belts meet legal requirements, they're not quite as good as diagonal belts are. Um, I think the key here with these things is uh, making sure you understand what the expectations of your parents are and making sure that the parents are informed about how their students will be transported. So that there's no surprises. Um, you know, worst case scenario, um, you don't want to have an incident and a parent be surprised that their child was in a lap belt um, or not in, in a booster seat. Um, when I mean, they didn't legally have to be in a booster seat. So you really want to make sure that you've got communication um, between your parents and your school. So you know how your parents are expecting your kids to be transported, their kids to be transported, and they understand that that's what's happening. Um, uh, the same principle applies a wee bit with airbags as well, uh, that the recommendations are um, that younger than 13 are in the back um, to be in the safest possible position from airbags. Uh, schools seem to be doing mixed things in this area. Um, some schools will have, uh, um, if the, the driver can have their own child in the front seat, but uh, not other children. Uh, but again, it's going back to um, what are the expectations of parents and you know, how are you informing them about um, how their student will be transported um, and just being really clear. There's um, some practical considerations here too um, that can make it a bit tricky if, you, if you've got a lap belt in the middle of the back seat, uh, you're suddenly down to only um, transporting two kids per car. So uh, those are some kind of thinking that schools need to do and then land on what it is um, that they, or how it is that they really want to transport kids and then making sure the parent body know that um, so that the parents are then making an informed choice about how their students will be transported. Um, any questions um, pertaining to seatbelts, child restraints or airbags? I can't see anything in the chat, so we'll, we'll whip on to managing long distance travel. So driver fatigue is um, the thing that's really key to consider here. Uh, and uh, how you go about your planning to manage that driver fatigue. So NZTA have uh, defined work time for commercial drivers at 13 hours, and that includes having a break, um, a half hour break every five and a half hours. And that driver or that work time includes the time they're driving and doing other work. Now, uh, your staff uh, and volunteers aren't co considered commercial drivers, but schools in their planning and especially their consideration about long distance travel and driver fatigue, should be considering those regulations and how work time looks um, for the teachers that they're expecting to drive. Um, you know, some examples would be you know, a teacher teaching all day uh, and then being expected to drive for students in a minivan for five hours. Um, that's probably not meeting good practice. Uh, another reasonably common example is where um, a teacher's been away on camp, they might have been up overnight um, supervising students overnight and having to get up and, and deal with students during the night, then out in the field with students for the day and then driving 
three or four hours back to school at the end of the day in the minivan. Um, again, not the best of practice. So in your planning, you're considering strategies that you put in place um, around those things to really consider what the total work time is, not just the time that they are driving. Uh, you know, things like if, if the staff member is on overnight duty at camp, then they're not the one that's driving home the next day. Uh, if um, the outdoor ed teacher's been away for five days in the field, uh, they're not driving home at the end of the fifth day. They're staying overnight and driving the kids home first thing in the morning after a good night's sleep. Those are the sort of types of strategies that um, you might be putting in place to deal with the work time. Um, other strategies to put in place, uh, making sure that you have pre-planned breaks on those long trips uh, so that you actually, uh, before you go, you know exactly where you're stopping and you're breaking up that, uh, that trip. And more than one driver is obviously great if you can. Uh, a lot of the time that's not practical. Uh, and so this concept of having an observer, you know, if you've got a trusted senior student in the passenger seat next um, to you or the um, beginner teacher that doesn't have a full driver's license, that can at least sort of keep an eye on um, how the driving's going. Obviously that's a, um, you need to be confident that that person feels safe to speak up. And then the, the concept of not driving after a full day in the field that we talked about. One of the important things with managing the long distance travel is if you do identify fatigue, um, what's the plan going to be to manage that? So you need to have that plan in place first before you go on the trip. So any questions about long distance travel and managing anything. Uh, so the last one uh, we'll look at today is the emergency response. Um, so schools need to ensure they've got the emergency response guide up to date and it covers the requirements of the trip. So you're covering things in there like um, if the vehicle breaks down, uh, if you have an incident, um, you know how you're going to manage the students, uh, who you're going to call and what you're going to need to do to resolve whatever that um, emergency is. Again, that's where you can fit in the how you're going to deal if, with um, driver fatigue if that's identified during the trip as a problem. Uh, other things to ensure in here is to really make sure your transport lists are correct and that is um, who is in each vehicle. Uh, not just who's on the entire trip. Uh, there's been cases where uh, one vehicle on a trip has been in an incident and there's been a lot of uncertainty about who is actually in that um, vehicle. Uh, and that wasn't helpful for the school having to deal with, um, with parents. Um, obviously, we've talked about driver fatigue um, and just making sure that everyone has a copy and understands that emergency response guide. Um, so they're not trying to read through it when it happens. Um, it's there for them to refer to, but they understand it and they um, have the competency to put it in place if they need to. Um, it's great to have a copy um, in your first aid kit in each vehicle um, as a backup plan as well. Any questions on emergency response? Sorry, Fiona, uh, uh, Denise has a query. Um, she's just put it on the chat. Denise, are you able to unmute and do you want to read that yeah. out? Explain that? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yep, I can hear you, Denise. Yeah, we've got a specific question related to alert level shifts. Because yeah. we're in Auckland and we are going to Kelly Tolton's for a sleepover in two weeks' time. Yeah. And so Kelly Tolton's have contacted us and said, we have to have a COVID emergency plan in place in case the alert level shifts while we're there. Yep. 
we would have to evacuate the place by 6 a.m. the next morning, get the kids home. So we've contacted the bus company and they've said, yes, they will send a bus to pick us up if they can because of their driver hours and availability. Right. Yeah. If they can't, then we would have to contact the parents and ask them to come and collect their children. Some parents can't do that, obviously, because yeah. they've got other kids who are asleep at home. And um, so we want to know how we stand for putting kids in other parents' cars. It's unlikely, but yeah. we need to make sure that we've dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, There's all of these unlikely scenarios at the moment, isn't there? That's right. Um, so I think I would go back to uh, that point about um, parents being clear about expectations. So maybe some in your communications pre these trips, um, you ask parents um, in the unlikely event that all of these things line up, yeah. we have to evacuate before 6 a.m. Um, if you can't drive or if you can't come and pick your child up, are you happy that another parent transports your child back to school? Yeah. That that's what we were thinking, but and we we've penned a letter to go to the parents asking for their consent to do that and yep. let us know if they can, are available to pick their child up obviously because if they misbehave we want them picked up or if they get sick we want them picked up yep. um but we just wanted to make sure that we'd got that right and that we could ask them that yeah because obviously yep. they would have to pick up teachers as well because we won't have our own cars there yeah we'll have one emergency vehicle but but that's all yeah I think it was all of these things if you go back to um, well, what are our parents expecting and mm -hmm. are they clear really clear on what's going to happen yeah and then they're giving informed consent and they've got the chance then to say hey no I'm not happy with that yeah um, and and work out a different strategy uh, obviously you have a parent I mean a teacher in charge there so oh yeah, yeah we've well, got two as, teachers as each night but... up, you know you're keeping a good record of who gets in what car and yeah that, yeah, all of those record keeping things would be really key. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Fingers crossed you don't have to put that into place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, oh, and there's another one there, slideshow available for us to use. Yes, absolutely. Um, these little videos and slideshows all go up onto the Eon site where you registered um, and you're free to share wildly. So just another couple of things before we finish off. Um, this is the homepage um, that you'll land on on Eon's website. Uh, this big button you can click to go through to the EOTC coordinator database. So if you're sharing um, that with, your, with the schools around you, um, this is where anyone that isn't an EO, hasn't got an EOTC coordinator registered can go and they can just click in there and follow the process. Uh, off the top bar into the EOTC management. This is where you find lots of the things we've been talking about today. Uh, there's some frequently asked questions and including a new transport one in here um, that might solve um, some of those questions straight away. Uh, this is the link to this Zoom series where you can register for up to upcoming ones, but also see all the old ones as well. Uh, the toolkit forms, anytime I've referred to a form today, and Kath the link that Catherine has posted is this link in here. Um, and then there's some other really useful stuff as well. The national database, you can, there's another link to register in here. Um, the good practice guides are also really worth a look for particular activities um, in there. So all of those links, it's well worth going through and having a little play around in there. Uh, now, are there any other questions at this stage? This email address down here, um, you can flick through at any time, any questions to me around EOTC. Um, and um, I can either come back to you. I'm happy to, um, you know, if you've drafted a little piece of um, 
a document uh, to support EOTC, I'm happy to have a look at that, or you've changed a form, or you've got a question about how a form might work, really happy to have a look at it. Um, I've done little Zooms, uh, you know, like a half hour Zoom with a department that's needed a some help with a particular um, problem or question, I'm really happy to do that as well. Um, so anything EOTC support related, um, just feel free. Ah, oh, Craig, you're right. Um, yep, you can see the the talks, but yeah, the videos, but not the powerpoints. All right, um, I can. I'm sure, or Catherine can upload the powerpoints. I'm sure, we can do that. Well, we'll work out how. Um, and now I'm just going to stop sharing this screen and just quickly have a wee look at uh, draft transport standard operating procedures. Okay, so hopefully, can you see the Word document on the desktop now? It's a bit small, Fiona. Are you able to share that document yeah. and not the not your screen? Oh, it's all right. Try that again. We all fall into that trap. Oh, it's because I switched it. But I tried to switch it between screens. That's better. It's a bit tricky. Okay. So, um, in the toolkit of forms, there's uh, form two, which is a risk assessment uh, and um, supervision. And then there's form three, which is a template for standard operating procedures. Uh, you wouldn't use both for an event, you'd use one or the other. Uh, so, this is an example of a standard operating procedure and the way you go about developing a standard operating procedure is to use form two and do the risk assessment and then take off the risk assessment, the things that have been identified as really significant and the things you really need to pay attention to for that particular activity. So in this case, it's transport, I've done a risk assessment form um, and I've pulled off the risk assessment form, the major hazards um, that I think should be monitored for this particular um, activity, transport. Also on the standard operating procedures, I pull in all these procedural things that I expect people to do um, when they're running this particular activity. So when they're transporting kids anywhere, these are the things I expect them to be able to tick off, but prior to leaving, as they leave, these are the major hazards that the risk assessment process has identified and they then need to keep a track of and monitor. Um, and then there's some standard requirements and the standard requirements and all of these check boxes up here are the things that will help mitigate against these major hazards. So if you're doing all of those things, then you should be covering your bases around um, mitigating and having controls in place to address the, the hazards that you're likely to face. Question. Yep. Um, we do that, but we don't have it specifically for transport. Like when we do our trips, we have a standing operating procedure for the whole trip. Yep. Is that okay? Because otherwise that staff are going to start to be like another one. So, or, uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, we wouldn't just have transport. It would be standing operating procedures for, I don't know, tramping at Mount Holsworth, which would include what we expect them to do when they're transporting the kids, when they're there, when they're, you know, all the things. Yep. That, yeah. Yep. So that's completely up to um, schools, how they mesh all of that information together. Um, yep, so you can have you can have it all together or you can have it separated out into what you might consider different activities. Um, yeah. For um, 
the transport one by itself can be a wee bit easier um, because it relates to so many different activities that might happen around um, school. And uh, you might have an activity where you're actually using a risk assessment in form two, and that's the process you're using for that activity. And that's how you're going to communicate the strategies that you've got in place to manage the risks. And then you might just put the transport standard operating procedures together with that to deal with the transport. So it's entirely up to schools, as long as you're considering um, all of the factors and how you're communicating them to the people involved in the activity. That makes sense. Um, so these are really, standard operating procedures are really good uh, where you um, have activities that happen a lot. Um, so the, they're already pretty much all written um, for the teacher in charge, except for the odd bits, and in here it's the text that is in blue, the odd bit that is particular to that activity on that day with those kids. So here, if I was going trans to do some transporting a group, um, this blue stuff up the top, the school would say what it is. Um, and all of this would already be done for me. I'd just be ticking the boxes off as I did those things, making sure I had everything and I'd read it all. And then this bit down here in the blue is about my particular trip. So I'd be doing that. So it really simplifies down the amount of information that each teacher is having to put onto a form. Um, and then there's some particular things down here as well. So it has that advantage. And you can set this up for all your local activities um, where, it's, where there are things that are happening a lot of the time, or a lot of different teachers are doing that particular thing and you want them to be running them consistently. And you don't want them all um, having to develop their own um, paperwork. Um, so this is just very draft at the moment, um, but if anyone on here would like to have a look at it and um, see if it would work in your school, just flick me an email and I can send it through to you um, as draft. Um, and it would be great to get some feedback on how it fits into the systems you're using at the moment and whether it's useful. The standard operating template um, has been there for a while, but we're now starting to think about actually populating a few of these to support schools. Um, any other questions on that very quick explanation of standard operating procedures? Okay, stop that. I'll just check the... Cool. Excellent, okay, I can see, well, yeah. Happy um, if you pop uh, either email me to that email address or pop um, as Stephanie has um, your email in the chat. I can um, send them out either way. Be great. And we'll sort out the PowerPoints. Uh, are there any other questions before we close off for the day? Okay, um, fantastic to see you all along and thank you for um, giving up your time. Hopefully that's been useful. Um, please feel free to keep flicking questions through. Um, also suggesting topics for future Zooms. I've got the next three um, sorted out on the EONS website, but after that, I'm totally up for what you'd like to hear about. Okay, so we'll say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Thanks Fiona. Thanks, Jan.